Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mark Cargill. I'm chairing this meeting. Uh, Tony Jefferson uh, sends his apologies. He's unfortunately gone down with a, a rather nasty virus. So I hope he recovers as quickly as possible. Right. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, right. Uh, we have no public speaking, uh, big public speakers um, down today. Um, so I'm going to go straight into the uh, agenda, if I may. Apologies for absence? No others. No, thank you. Disclosures of interest, members. Are there any disclosures of interest? Councillor Hart. Uh, Mr Chairman, I would just like, with regard to item 11, Wellsbourne Manford Airfield compulsory acquisition of third parties, I would just like to say that, that I have been associated with the airfield over many years, uh, and I think it's appropriate that I don't take part in, part in the debate. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hampton. Thank you. Uh, on the same item, I think we've all had the same letter. So just to note that we've all had that. Yes, thank you, Councillor. That's right. Any other declarations? No? Okay, thank you. Right, minutes of meeting. Members, are you uh, happy with the minutes of meeting? And um, can I sign them in abstentia for Councillor Jefferson? Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Right. Now let's move on to the uh, next item then, which is item four, notion of motion, rural and urban capital improvements grants, page 17. Right. Okay, on this particular um, point, this item, uh, I note the motion as submitted. I'm aware that there are other councils running such schemes successfully. Uh, needless to say, there are many questions that need to be answered before we could adopt a scheme in, uh, in, the, in this council. Uh, right. I understand also that there was a similar scheme that took place in this council some years ago but was withdrawn. That's something we we'll need to look into. Uh, my recommendation is, uh, as per uh, option B, which is to defer consideration of the motion to await reports from officers uh, to the next available meeting of the Cabinet. Now, on this I would expect uh, the number of questions to be raised, such as the sustainability of the funding. Uh, for example, I wouldn't want to see come reserves. Who can apply? How? The maximum grant available? Qualifying, cri qualifying criteria? Much more. Uh, and also, of course, there will be some administration included in this as well. So I'd like all these points to be brought into the report. Um, I am aware, as I said, that uh, Councillor Richards, who brought this forward, has um, already indicated that there's uh, some documentation which he'd uh, like to submit for this review and also to be included in the, um, in the process as well. So I'm more than happy for that. Uh, members, any questions? Councillor Pemberton. Yeah, just some clarification there. I think the uh, uh, question of uh, its ref uh, uh, an officer's report. So, in the ordinary course of events, the offer. I, I just wanted some clarification about the involvement of any members, which that, that seems to then have the flavour of some kind of working group. Where actually, I think the recommendations talking about a report. So, I'm just looking for some guidance as to the format of the return response and the process to, to achieve that. So, that would be helpful. 
Hi, yeah. So what, what we're thinking of here is that we would have an officer lead on this piece of work. But I know that Councillor Richard was keen to feed in some of his thinking behind the motion. Um, rather than it be a, a working group. It was just to feed in some, some further thoughts. Any other discussion to make? Uh, well, in that case then, uh, I'd like to go to the uh, motion, which is to be just to defer consideration of the motion to wait reports from the officers to the next available meeting of the Cabinet. That will be post-elections. Okay, all those in favour? Thank you. The next item, oh, I'll take this out of here first. Bring it afterwards. Bring it to the yes, Apparently there is a cabinet meeting prior to the, the, uh, the elections. I'm not suggesting it be brought forward at that point. It will be after the elections. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item five, the proposed performance management framework measures and monitoring arrangements 2019-2020. Okay, hold on a second. Right. Um, we've all obviously seen multiple reports of these over the years. Um, what I would like to say is that this could well be the last report in this format because uh, I've indicated this previously that I'd like to fully review the structure, the content, the style of the report in the new council year. Again, this is going to be something for the, the new councillors as well. New members should have the opportunity to comment as well. Uh, I have a number of thoughts, of course, and I would, uh, but I would like to see each departmental head assess their KPIs to see if they're still relevant, do they meet the needs and aspirations of this council, do we need as many as there are there or are there too few? It's quite a wide-ranging uh, review. Should we also move to a more efficient me method of presentation? This is the question. For example, certain indicators could be by exception reporting, as opposed to having them presented each time. And also, I'd like to see uh, updates on some of the trajectories, because one of the items in the report has been um, commented on, are we above or below the trajectory? It's very difficult with a snapshot uh, report to actually see the trajectory over the year. Are we going to achieve the desired result at the end of the, uh, of the period, the planned period? Uh, so these are the sort of things I'd like to uh, look at. Right. Um, I, again, expect to bring this strategy to Cabinet in the uh, new Council year. Uh, the the um, recommendations are in the agenda. Are there any comments, members? Councillor Morse. Thank you, Chairman. There are a, a number I wanted to comment on. Chairman, starting on page 24, CSE 1 talks about the BDUK problem um, program. <laughs> Chairman, I don't know if you're intending to take this anywhere else, BDUK. Have you got it down for urgent business? If not, I'll leave it to then. Have you got it down for urgent business? If so, I'll leave BDUK until then. You haven't? No, no, a, a great shame, Chairman. I'm, I'm sure the residents regard the problems as urgent, but I accept the point. Can I just comment on this, Chairman, that at the moment we're going uh, Can I just interrupt? Uh, I th mm. To pick up your point, it is an urgent problem, uh, and it, but there is a process, and as, I, as you're no doubt aware, uh, we are actually going through that due process at the moment. And, and Mr. Council, uh, Mr. Platts, would you like to uh, uh, update on that? Okay. would make a point. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we're talking here about contributing to phase three of the BDUK programme, rolling out broadband in the district. Uh, we seem to be hitting problems, Chairman. Uh, phase two is apparently six months behind. Phase three, which we're talking about here commencing April 2019, was meant to start in December. So we appear to be five months behind minimum on that. Um, the, the project, as you're aware, is Coventry, Solihull and Warwickshire. But I understand now that Coventry have withdrawn from the BDUK scheme and are contracting with somebody else. We're due under Phase 3, Chairman, next year to pay half a million pounds 
for this scheme. Uh, I just wondered if this is a realistic programme that we're laying down here or whether we should be considering what we should be doing. Thank you. Well, I can, I can confirm that um, Peter is correct, um, that Coventry have pulled out of the BDU contract and they are contracting with City Fibre. Um, yes, th th there are delays with the project. Um, I had a meeting with them last week and they are currently in the process of identifying what impact Coventry's withdrawal um, has for the rest of us and it may, may well be that there's going to be some more funding coming back into the remaining districts. Um, at the minute um, they're still trying to work through that. Um, they've called another meeting for the 27th of March when the new numbers in terms of properties for connection um, will be released and at that point they'll have a much better um, idea about where they're going with the plan. The current rollout is six months behind, that's absolutely right. That was advertised widely across um, on, the, on the stakeholder um, latest circulation list. So yes, there is a, a significant amount of work still outstanding on that project, but they are now trying to regroup and by the end of March we'll have a further plan that they'll come forward with and that may be, I say, that we will have extra money. So that all needs to be held over until that meeting on the 27th. Okay. Thank you, Jim, and I think that's a very helpful update. Thank you. Um, next point. I have five points, just to reassure you, Jim, I'm not going on every single one. Um, on page 27, we talk about the capitals, uh, Council's capital and investment strategy will be considered in February two 2019. Now, I may have missed this. Um, David's nodding that I have missed this. <laughs> Has this been published, Chairman? Yeah, Chairman, through you, yes, that was um, published and was uh, present, approved as part of the cap uh, Council's considerations at, at the end of February. So in that case, I'll move rapidly on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, 28, Chairman, page 28, on SIL. Um, First funds to be collected, allocated by t September 2019. I was somewhat concerned by the comment from the uh, SPAG the, at, the, at the very end of your papers, Chairman, on page 168, the Strategic Policy Advisory Group, which says, in light of the current uncertainty around the timing of reforms, members agreed that further information was needed, including consideration as to whether SIL spending arrangement should be put on hold in 2019. Now, Chairman, that will come as um, a great concern, I'm sure, to many parish councils who've put through neighbourhood plans with a view to maximising the SIL they could get. I wonder if we can have an update, Chairman, on what is actually planned to happen there. Thank you, Robert. Chairman, if I can, if I can assist, the, there is no suggestion that parish or town councils would be... Um, would be prevented from accessing any of their um, SIL funds. Um, it was simply uh, that, that the amount of money that the council's holding as a result of SIL currently is in the region of £75,000, which, if it were to be divided between schemes of an infrastructure size, perhaps wouldn't necessarily give the benefit that I think the council would want to make with an investment decision. So. Um, Unless we get a rapid increase in the SIL receipts received between now and September, it, it might be a decision for the council to make at that point. But there's certainly no negative implications for any parish or town council. They all still receive their SIL allocations accordingly. Thank you, Chairman. That's very reassuring, I'm sure, for the Can I just council. ask a yeah, question please. on that, if I may? Um, our part of the SIL regime is that a certain amount goes directly to the parishes. I assume that that's gone straight in, yeah. So they have had some of the monies. It's just the what's in the, 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 the pot. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. At page 29, um, another one for Mr. Platts, I'm afraid. Land charge searches. Percentage turned around within 10 working days. Um, uh, I share your reservations about this report, Chairman, because um, we've got here mid-year 2018-19 result 9.28%, um, with a target now of 50%. Chairman, is this realistic? I, I understand that at the moment, uh, and, and last month, we were running 34 days 
34 working days as the average, as the average for completion of land charge searches, um, much longer than the period on which m most solicitors work from exchange to completion, Chairman. So is this a realistic target? Councillor Pemberton, did you want to comment on that? I'll let uh, Phil, as the lead officer rather than Mr. Platts, uh, answer initially. I've got some updated info from this morning, if needs be. Yeah. So to answer your question directly, Councillor Morse, at the, at the present time, as you know, the land charge service is going through a huge project to modernise the service. And at this point in time, we are in the middle of phase two. So phase one was the purchase of the new software um, to answer the land charge searches. Phase two is the start of populating the system. Um, and phase three is going to be the cleansing of the data to make sure that all the re land charge search results are accurate. Um, as I say, it's a huge project. Right at the moment, it is really, really difficult to say uh, whether the target is realistic or unrealistic. The lunch charge team itself, which comprises three people, is faced firstly with clearing the backlog of outstanding searches, but also at the same time assisting with the project to move us forward. Um, so to answer your question, it's very difficult to say at the moment, but certainly by the time that we get into May, the prospect is that the data cleansing will have started and we'll be in a position where some of the answers to the questions in the form will be um, will be guaranteed correct so the team don't have to look at those. And as we move forward in time, the amount of automated answering will, will gradually increase. Councillor Pemberton. Thank you, Chair. I, I'm, going to be, I, I'm going to be more positive uh, in the sense of I've, I've had the benefit of seeing the numbers this morning. There's a grand total of 84 searches outstanding across the piece, including the ones that arrived on Friday. And in November, that was north of 350. So there are nine left in November. Um, November and December will be clear before the end of the month. And, and looking at the numbers, uh, there'll be a handful left in January. This 9.28 is a, is, a, is, a, is a look backwards. Um, if we were to actually do the analysis today, it would be higher than that. The 34 days is the external reporting uh, from um, central government on our performance. Um, I'm quite confident that when uh, we get to look at the revised or singing or dancing format that the deputy leader in envisages, um, that the, the proposed 1920 target, it's quite right. Uh, as Phil Grafton says, that we haven't moved this because it's in a, it, it is in a state of flux. Because what we would end up doing is the, the targets would be moving every, every time this report was, was actually updated uh, for Cabinet. So it's right for us to reconsider in you know, the 1920 target when we come to review the, the performance. But I just want to give a really big uh, positive message that the officers in that team, ably led by Diane Keane, are absolutely going a storm at, this, at that piece of work. Um, and uh, the, 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 the positive messages are coming back. And the land charges companies are, are actually recognising that the, the turnaround times are, are, are falling dramatically. So I absolutely want to get that message out that this, that team is going in absolutely the right direction. And final point, if I may, Chairman, on page 31. Um, percentage of disabled facilities grant application processed with the, the average end-to-end -end time of 2.44 calendar days. Um, Chairman, we're currently, or well, last year we were on 163 days. We're now talking about a target of 210 calendar days. Chairman, that's seven months, and I would suggest that for many disabled people, um, from start to completion of a project of seven months is unacceptable. Okay. Chairman, I, I, I take Councillor Morse's point, but, but for some disabled people, a delay of a day would, would be unacceptable. Um, and this, this is now, as you know, run on a county-wide basis, this, this scheme. And even at 210 calendar days, which, which is, I accept, an increase from, from the average of the, the, the previous year, 
it is still significantly better than the arrangements we had in place when we operated as an individual authority. Um, and there are, there are forecast a number of, of changes to the process that are going to be implemented during the next 12 months, which is why we've had to recognise that that may well impact on the speed of delivery. Not to do that, I think, would have been unfair on, on the Council in suggesting that we could do it faster than we are able. Um, and where we can, we will, of course, do that. We, we, this, this is not giving people more time to do little. This is really recognising the challenges that we know are going to come into the process. But we will endeavour, as always, to bring that down um, wherever possible. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor, could you have a comment? Thank you. Um, page 20, performance monitoring and reporting arrangements. Um, th there was a discussion at Overview and Scrutiny Committee about whether um, some of the monitoring and reporting could be done by said committee in the next council. And that was the only comment I wish to make. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Right, and, and uh, picking your points up, Councillor, I think it's, it is valid that we review these things. And perhaps we should be more aspirational on some of the targets as well that we're looking at. So I'm open to, to comments and, and, and looking at those sort of things. So yes, that'll be part of my, my review. My all singing, all dancing. What is it you say, Councillor? Thank you. Okay, members, then the... Uh, before you, then, the recommendation is uh, four recommendations to approve the Corporate Strategy Plan Action Plan Year 5, 2019-2020, Appendix 1, to approve the key PIs and targets, Appendix 2, to approve the District Health Measures, Appendix 3, and to approve the monitoring arrangements set out in Paragraph 3. All those in favour? Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Member Development Working Forward Plan. Councillor Thurwell. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, this particular working group met on the 11th of February 2019, and even though it did make just a small adjustment to the member, Member's Induction Programme six-month review, with recommendation of further officers being present. The reason for the report to come to you today is um, we ask you that you look at the Member Development Working Group forward plan items and approve them. Thank you. Before we move on to that, um, I'd just like to say that we've just recently come through a peer review uh, process in March, and it was a very, very positive uh, outcome from the, from the, uh, the team that came in here. Uh, some of which were here two years ago, and they have seen um, improvements, and they commented such. But one thing I'd just like to say is that on the member development, um, they actually say that is class leading. So you are doing exceptionally well in that area. So well done to uh, Stephen and David and the team for, for doing that. Well done. Okay, um, right. The recommendation... Oh, is there any other comments, members? No? Okay, the recommendation is that the Member Development Working Forward Group Forward Plan items be approved. All those in favour? Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Development Requirement Supplementary Planning Document, Adoption of Part E. And Councillor Pemberton, would you like to introduce this? Thank you. Um, as members of Cabinet will be aware, um, we've been bringing forward uh, supplementary planning documents uh, on, a, on a library and ongoing basis, and this is the latest part of the uh, S SPD uh, to be brought forward, which is Part E that refers to architectural style, construction and materials. Um, the policy has been um, reviewed by officers, has been through a public consultation during March and April, and further advice updates have, have been uh, put together. Um, so this... Uh, has, is following on from 10 other parts of the SPD uh, already brought to Cabinet and formally adopted. Um, so um, happy to take questions through uh, the relevant officer who's an expert in this stuff uh, at the back if needs be. But uh, no, you're not, an, you're not an expert, Rob, no. <laughs> Um, uh, and seeking uh, support for the recommendation that the Council formally adopts Part E. Agricultural style construction and materials as part of the development requirements supplementary planning document. Any comments, members? 
Councillor Cashmill. I think this is an excellent, excellent document, uh, and congratulations to the team who's, who's brought it forward. Um, I mean, one thing that I'd like to be assured is that um, where we have styles identified, um, where there has been a case in the past where we've had the right style in the wrong place, uh, and we had Haunton Stone buildings uh, in an area which had never seen a Haunton Stone building in its life before. That was a military pre core strategy today, so I think it was a little bit wild and out of control, not any fault of members or officers here. Um, but can we be assured that there will be an area focus so that we ensure that the stars identified so clearly can be, identif can be allocated to the right patch? And the second question is, how can we ensure that developers actually follow these styles rather than going to their database of, um, you know, oh, we need three, three one-bed, 28 two-bed and 58 three-bed houses. Let's just take it off our database. How can we ensure that these styles will actually be used in reflecting the new houses that are going to come through? So um, I think the very first thing uh, to say, other than the observation about uh, the, the chairman talking about style, um, <laughs> I think the, the very first thing to note that, uh, is to say that uh, it is heartening to hear the chairman and I think the chairman's positive comments about the work done here by officers uh, is, is really heartening and actually uh, says more than, than, than I can say about the, the great piece of work that they've done. Um, once the, the policy has been adopted, um, it enables our development officers to be far more robust uh, around um, the use where appropriate of uh, various architectural styles and materials. Uh, I make no comment as to whether there is a place for Horton Stone in anywhere other than Horton. Uh, if, uh, uh, <laughs> However, I think the other, the other uh, so I'm quite happy to give all of those assurances that the, that the chairman and other members are seeking, but that comes with a, a plea that uh, uh, across this authority, um, uh, ward members do actively engage both with our planning officers, uh, their local neighbourhoods through neighbourhood groups uh, uh, and, and, their, and their planning processes, planning officers and the developers at an early stage in relation to developments to ensure that um, they are also m uh, making the case for the most appropriate materials rather than uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Councillor Organ. Chairman, being uh, a little bit nitpicky here on page 5.22, the three illustrations, the top one, I don't believe, figure E23 is a double pitch canopy. Uh, as always, uh, officers ensure that there is something put in there to ensure that the papers are read thoroughly by all members. Good answer, Councillor Clemson, thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, I'd just like to echo the Chairman's uh, view on this. I think it's a very good document. Uh, I did read it, I didn't pick that up, so there you go. Uh, and again, we're seeing some excellent work coming out of the, uh, the Planning Policy Department at the moment, so well done and keep, keep it up. Okay, members, the um, recommendation before you is that the Council formally adopts Part E brackets, architectural style, construction and materials, and no close brackets, as part of the development requirements supplementary planning document. All those in favour? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Excellent. The next item on the agenda is Councillor Pemberton. Thank you, members. Bring forward the Great Walford Village Design Statement. Um, you will note the recommendations that the Great Walford Village Design Statement uh, of 2019 be adopted as a local information source to offer advice uh, to the relevant services of the District Council and that in relation to land within the parish of Great Walford it be endorsed as a material consideration in determining planning applications um, in accordance with the core strategy with particular reference to policy CS9 design and distinctiveness um, that subject to one and two above a request be made to Great Walford Parish Council for them to make arrangements for the document to be made available to the public. Village design statements are, are an important um, piece of work uh, 
uh, to help set uh, a clear outline of the character of particular village against which planning applications should be assessed. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the group of volunteers and uh, Great Walford Parish Council who have worked uh, alongside our officers to produce this piece of work which is a, is a really useful and important piece of material guidance. Um, so with that um, sort of vote of thanks for those who have put this all together because uh, none of these things are easy and uh, they do take an awful lot of time and, di and diligence uh, by volunteers. Um, the VDS was endorsed by Great Walford's Parish Council on the 26th of uh, January this year by letter to, to us here at the District Council. Uh, so subject to any questions or um, any areas of nitpicking, uh, happy for us to move to the, uh, happy to hope that you will uh, agree the recommendation. Thank you, members. Are there any comments? No? Okay. We'll go to the recommendations then. Uh, one, that the Great Walford VDS 2019 Appendix to be adopted as a local information source to offer advice to the relevant services of Stratford on Avon District Council. That the Great Walford VDS 2019, as pertaining to land within the parish of Great Walford, be endorsed as a material consideration in the determination of planning applications in accordance with the core strategy, in particular policy CS9, design and distinctiveness, and finally, Finally, that subject to one and two above, a request be made to Great Walford Parish Council for them to make arrangements for the document to be made available to the public. All those in favour? Great, thank you. The next item is Capital Budget Monitoring Council Organ. Um, thank you. This report covers the first ten months of the year 2018-19 up to the 31st of January 19. The total capital budget for the year is 6,543,827 and progress on the capital projects is detailed in Appendix 1 with uh, Appendix 2 covering the Section 106 funds. Thank you. The recommendation is to receive the position on capital expenditure. Thank you. Councillor Laws. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, just a couple of quick queries um, about the Section 106 money. Page 133, fourth item from the bottom, I see that the money here, 16,000, had to be spent by January 2019. I wonder, since that date has now passed, whether we have to repay that money to the developer, Chairman. And also on page 131, £20,000 for public art at the Waitrose Roundabout expires in June. Seems to be getting perilously close to the date. And could we have some reassurance on both those items, Chairman? Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Morse will be pleased to know that both of those items I have already taken up. Um, the public art on the Waitrose Island is one that I have been seeking um, uh, comfort on for probably 12 months now, knowing that there are roadworks that have to take place before that can actually happen. But I am reassured by the officers that uh, that, that will be okay. With regard to the social housing monies, um, this is a, a little bit more complicated in that lots of monies go into the pots and lots flow out into different schemes. But again, I am reassured that that is not in a situation that is likely to result in it being returned. And I'm extremely sensitive on this as we recall the situation that happened some years ago with regard to some Section 106 monies for a project in Sanborn. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then the recommendation is that the position on capital expenditure and income for period 1 to 10 of 2018-19 is received and any issues identified for further consideration by a further report to the Cabinet or by the portfolio holder. All those in favour? Thank you. Right, the next item is revenue budget monitoring. Councillor Organ. Thank you, Chairman. This report covers the same period as the capital budget monitoring and it analyzes expenditure against the profiled budget. 
Members will recall that earlier in this year, um, a number of initiatives were added into this year's budget, and it was not anticipated that all of these would be undertaken within this financial year. Uh, so this report includes the slippage requests to cover these items. And the recommendations are on page 135, and the result of these recommendations is a forecast outturn favourable variance of 204,783. Thank you. Councillor Morse. One very quick question, Chairman, which I think has been covered before, but um, I would like to resurrect now just because it affects a subsequent item. Um, on page 139, investment income favourable variance of 45,000. That's after 10 months. Expected outcome after 12 months, a favourable variance of 147,000. Chairman, could I ask, is this because we're not accruing income as we go along? Chairman, yeah, we, when we do the period accounts, we're doing that on a cash basis, not on a cause basis. So we are expecting that payment at the year end. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we'll go to the recommendation that the variance as set at period 10 and the estimated revenue outturn for 2018-19 is received and any issues identified for further consideration by a further report to the Cabinet by the, or by the portfolio holder, that the write-off be identified within, sorry, the write-off identified within Section 2.2 be noted, revenue slippage identified within Section 3.3 to be approved or amended. Sorry, uh, yes. Okay, all those in favour? Thank you. The next item then is our item 11, which is Wells Ball Mountfield Airport Airfield compulsory acquisition of third party interest. Members, I'd like to remind you that we have blue papers on this. Uh, so if there is any discussion on this item, then we would need to go into closed session. Uh, due to the legal stroke professional privilege of the financial affairs relating to the authority. Um, so, do members want to go into closed session? No? Chairman, can I just ask uh, on that for guidance? Because you say if there's any discussion on this, surely if it, 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 we should only be not discussing if, if it relates to an item on the blue papers. If it relates to an item on the white papers... Oh, sorry, OK, I, mis I misunderstood your guidance. No, 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 you're absolutely right. I said if anything on the blue papers that is discussed, if we want to discuss anything on there, then we would have to go into closed session. Otherwise, uh, OK. Uh, Councillor Organ, do you want to move on? Um, thank you. The airfield owner's intention is to develop the airfield for approximately 1,800 new dwellings, and it is apparent from the owner's actions that they are seeking to run down the current use of the airfield site to pave the way for its closure and redevelopment. Although officers have commenced negotiations with the owners, powers of compulsory purchase will be necessary to properly protect the airfield site. Government policy states that planning policies should recognise the importance of maintaining a national network of general aviation airfields and the Council's core strategy supports the retention of the airfield. It is considered that there are sufficient compelling reasons, as outlined within the report, for compulsory purchase powers to be sought at this time. The Council has a clear idea of how it intends to use the land and is in discussions with potential operators should the acquisition of the site be successful. The recommendations and conclusions are in paragraph 9, which is on page 160, and I would like to amend paragraph 911 by adding on the words after safeguard the existing use of the order land alongside negotiations for voluntary acquisition. These words are in order that it is quite clear that any compulsory purchase would only be used as and when. 
The implications of any compulsory purchase are clearly set out in Para 7 of the report, and the risk assessment is included in Para 8. The necessary recommendations to make, confirm, and implement a compulsory purchase order to acquire Wellsbourne Mountfield Airfield are in paragraph 9, as amended, and the recommendation is that these recommendations, as amended, are not endorsed but approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any discussions? Councillor Chairman, there are four points I would like to raise. Um, do you wish me to do them separately or all four at once? Well, <laughs> in interrupt me afterwards, certainly. Chairman, um, we state that paragraph 1.6, although officers have started to enter into ne negotiations with the owners to secure the voluntary acquisition, acquisition of the land, Chairman, we've all had a letter from the, the, the landowners uh, um, dated 6th of March, only a few days ago, and it says in there, the council has made no attempt since November 2016 to discuss their proposals with us. So, Chairman, our report is saying we've had discussions. This is saying there's been nothing since 2016. They cannot both be right, Chairman. Chair, I Sorry, just want to get some clarification from our legal officer here. I'm aware, as all members of the Cabinet are, that we've had a pre-action protocol letter um, and that the, these kind of conversations about who said what and who did what start then to go to the heart of the process and the litigation here. So I'm not entirely comfortable that we should be going down that road at all at this point without some advice from officers on that. Thank you. So um, you'll be aware that we've got two bits of um, paper that have been handed round um, during the course of the meeting. I don't know whether you've had a chance to to look at them. Uh, right. So um, first of all, I'm not I'm not aware that there's any pre-action protocol letter or. So, um, what I am aware of is that the letter. Um, to all members from two of the Littler family dated the 6th of March, which sets out a number of um, points uh, which have then been responded to in the separate paper, which is headed Wellsbourne Airfield Update to Cabinet Report of the 11th of March. Um, I think that you'll find within the response that that particular point has been dispelled to a certain extent but I will leave uh, perhaps other officers in the room to give the detail around that. Uh, apologies if I've misunderstood where we currently are at with that, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take, take, you, take you on there. Sorry, um, so are we happy with that particular point? I think um, if people haven't had the chance to read the update sheet, which is understandable because we need to circulate during the meeting. Um, we have made attempts to um, open discussions with the owners of Wellsbourne Airfield. We don't really recognise the tone of the letter that they sent to us. Um, they've not been terribly obliging in their response. We set out some more detail in the, in the update sheet to Cabinet. Um, if um, what they're suggesting in their letter is true, we may be having more productive discussions with them in the near future, which would be along the spirit of the twin tracking approach which Councillor Organ has suggested in the report. And just to reassure you, my remaining three points of clarification rather than anything else. The second you, point, Chairman, could we just clarify that this has no impact upon Wellsburn Market? I I've found it difficult to work out from the papers we've seen so far whether Wellsburn Market is included in the airfield site that we're looking at. Um, yes, Wellsbourne Airfield, we're, we're still sort of getting to the bottom of how all these structures work. Well, the site of Wellsbourne Airfield is certainly with, falls within the land that we are seeking to acquire, either through voluntary acquisition or through compulsory purchase. Um, there is some form of agreement between the market operators and the airfield owners that we're, we're working on investigating at the moment. So, yes, that site is included. The third point is on the legal costs that we've set aside 1.125 million for in next year's budget. 
as I've pointed out previously, Chairman, this is one pound in every seven that we're trying to raise in council tax next year. Um, we've just heard from Mr Buckland on an earlier item that we're only accruing when invoices are received. <coughs> Oh, oh, is that wrong, Sorry, David? Mr. Chairman, in relation to investment interest, we, we only do that on a cash account basis. All of the commitments otherwise are shown on, on the expenditure side. Thank you, Chairman, for that clarification. So clearly members will be appraised on a monthly basis of money that is being spent. I'm sure members wouldn't want to get a sudden nasty shock after six months to find that all 1.1 million had been spent without them realising how it was progressing. So on that reassurance, thank you, Chairman. My final point is on page 156, when we talk about um, 4.11. As a result of these discussions, a short list of potential partners has been drawn up. Chairman, Perhaps the, the process of this could be explained to me, because are we saying anybody else is excluded, or are we going out to a tender process? Uh, this very much gives the implication that it's a done deal. Shall I take that one as well? Um, it's a, a slightly iterative process, to be honest. We have to show... Um, to secure a compulsory purchase order that we have a compelling case in the public interest and the ability to proceed and implement the order. So insofar as we needed to demonstrate that, we needed to engage with people who could potentially run the airfield. Um, if and when that comes to pass, we would run a, we would invite expressions of interest widely, we would have a formal appraisal process and the most viable um, bidder against a set of agreed criteria would be appointed as a partner to, to join with us in it. But uh, at the moment we have, um, it's really people who've approached us, we've, we've sought um, due diligence to show that it, it, it is proceedable, but before we settle on a final partner we, we would sort of do sort of further investigations and invite interest. That's fine, Chairman. It's obviously going to be an open process. I won't ask whether EU tender rules will apply at that date, but, uh, but that's helpful, helpful guidance, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should just say also that um, on that particular point, talking about the 1.12 million pounds, uh, that in the citizens' uh, panel feedback we got, 61% of people were in favour of that, so they were supportive of that. So I think that uh, there's, a, there's a certainly groundswell of um, support for this action. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions that you would like to uh, ask? No. Okay then. Then I'm going to go to the recommendations to and conclusion. Now, Councillor Organ, you could just re go over what your addition was to 911, please. Certainly. Certainly. To add on to Para 911, after the words existing use of the order land alongside negotiations for voluntary acquisition. And on the recommendation on page 151, to alter the final word of the recommendation, which is shown as endorsed, to change it to approved. Chairman, I'm just wondering whether we need to put out, set out as, in section 9 as amended. I think we can do that. Thank you, members. The uh, recommendation before you is that the recommendations set out in section 9 as amended, as we've just discussed, are uh, approved. All those in favour? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll move on now to uh, item 12, which is, oh yes, in fact in this particular point, uh, I think we have a, a, an exemption request, is that correct? Are we asking for some, Phil? 
Uh, I think the situation, Chairman, is that there are some blue papers at the back of your packs, which include um, the, the appendix, which is the business continuity management policy, and the proposal there, although it's for your decision, is to exempt that um, from publication, so that if there is any discussion about the blue, pa the blue paper, then you'd be invited to uh, make a resolution to exclude the press and the public. Thank you. Right. Um, Councillor Howells, would you like to introduce the item? And just remind members, if you wish to discuss anything in the blue papers, we will have to go into closed session. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, uh, item 12, the business continuity management policy. Um, just by way of introduction, I'd like to inform the Stratford District Council has a statutory duty under the Civil Contingency Act 2004 to maintain adequate plans in the case of a serious incident to continue to function in an operational state. Clearly these plans are highly sensitive and it is for that reason that the business management policy is on blue paper and uh, CSW retain intellectual property rights over this document. Business continuity is vital so that in the event of a serious incident or natural disaster, the business can recover to an operational state in as short a time as possible. There are three elements to business continu continuity. One is resilience. This means that the infrastructure is designed to cope with most disruptions. Two, the second one is recovery. This is to restore critical business to functions as soon as possible. And item three, contingency. This means that the organisation has the capability and is ready to deal with any emergency. Warwickshire County Council's internal audit uh, service have carried out a review and reports that our controls provide substantial assurance that risks are being managed. Following the report, SDC have engaged with Coventry, Solihull and Warwickshire Emergency Planning and Business Continuity Team to provide a dedicated expert resource for us. We have uh, Interjit Dahl with us from the organisation. He is here today and he, he is prepared to answer any questions that you might have. David Platts and our senior management team are responsible for ensuring that this policy is fit for purpose and have already done a considerable amount of work, but there is still some work to do with individual service teams uh, to be employed, and this is ongoing. Business continuity has to work right across the organisation, and this policy enables it to happen. The recommendation is that Cabinet approve the business continuity management plan. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any questions of either Council House or Indigit? I think you got away with that one, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Um, members, the recommendation before you is that the business continuity management policy is approved and adopted. All those in favour? Thank you. Right. Members, the next items are en bloc. Um, we are looking at item 13, the Cabinet Work Programme, to follow. Mm -hmm. You've got copies? Oh, I'll just read it out. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Caroline. Uh, key decision three, development requirements SPD to, to endorse further parts of the development uh, uh, requirements SPD for adoption of the council, which are part C, access and connectivity, part D, buildings and layout, Part F, residential amenity. Part S, general and local needs housing. And Part T, specialised housing. Okay, so that's that particular item. Thank you. Uh, you've seen the uh, strategic policy advisory group. You receive the minutes for that. Member development working group uh, for that. All those in block items agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Item urgent business. Any urgent business? No, no, no urgent business. Therefore, I think we can close the meeting. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>